the longer you're going to have problems with sleep, eventually dementia and death. In the meantime, increased risk of cancer, increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of osteoporosis, increased risk of heart disease, I mean, just everything. Hello, everyone. Our topic today is the impact of sleep on stress, anxiety, depression, blood pressure, and practical tips for better sleep from an expert on sleep. So our guest today is Dr. Benjamin Smart, assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. He's a leading expert on sleep and uh, circadian rhythms, and currently is a technical lead on a global project for early detection and severity prediction of COVID-19 outcome. Dr. Smart, welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Dimitri. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate it. Fantastic. What are circadian rhythms and why they, are, they have such a big impact on human physiology? And what kind of chronic conditions can people develop if they violate uh, these reasons? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so circadian, just to break it down, it's circa, about, and dia is day. So it's these rhythms that take about a day. And they're actually deeply, deeply baked into us. Uh, so the very first cellular life forms on this planet had to deal with radiation from the sun. And when you're a single cell, if you get sunburned, game over. And so uh, very early on, there was this strong, strong adaptive pressure to be able to anticipate when is the sun gonna be up so they don't get scorched. And mm -hmm. so the very first cells were able to move up and down in the ocean so that they could go up and photosynthesize and get energy, but then get down in time to protect themselves. They evolved into all of life on earth. Of course, this is the simple version, but broad strokes, that's roughly true. And so then all of our cells still have that machinery, which means whether it's your pancreas or your eyeballs or your brain or your skin, those cells expect time of day to matter. And so to the extent that they have to work with each other, right, that my brain has to work with my kidneys to process waste or with my stomach to make me have the right meal times, they need to line up. Uh, and that's where modern culture makes this very challenging. And that's where we get into some of these mental illness issues as well as chronic health issues. The more that we, for example, stay up with a bright light in our face, some of our brain sees that light and goes, oh, it's daytime, I better change my clocks. I guess I was wrong. Whereas, for example, your liver or your muscles, they don't see the light. So they go, what are you talking about? It's late at night, you're crazy. And now all of a sudden they can't talk to each other, right? They're, they're, they have a major jet lag in between them. And so as a result, your body starts to have a lot of friction. Instead of the gears fitting together nicely, they grind on each other. And that friction leads to just about every chronic illness you can name. Uh, so the longer that you have that kind of circadian disruption, the longer you're going to have problems with sleep, eventually dementia and death. In the meantime, increased risk of cancer, increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of osteoporosis, increased risk of heart disease, I mean, just everything. And the reason it's so broad, it's not because circadian rhythms is sort of its own isolated thing that is just magically strong, but it's just a principle governing all of your systems. And so all of your systems are at risk when that principle gets violated. Okay, got it. All right, um, understand. Um, and uh, specifically sleep. So, so why is adequate sleep so important for humans? And then sleep is a really interesting layer on top of circadian rhythms. So sleep in sort of broad strokes comes from two different places, uh, two different needs. One need is the more you've been active, the more your body needs time to do a maintenance cycle, right? Clear out all of the waste products, refresh the muscles, uh, clear out any sugar deposits, all, all these things. Um, so that's one reason you sleep. And that's why if you've worked a really hard day, uh, you come home and you just go thump and you sort of black out, you go straight into deep sleep. That's that really physical recovery sleep. There's also refreshing your brain, practicing memories, uh, and letting your brain do things that if it happened when you were conscious would make driving a car very hard, right? So it's very hard to, for example, fixatively think about Am I remembering my new language that I'm learning? Or am I going over these conversations with the people I had? If you're still trying to make sense of what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you consolidate memories. That's also how you clear your buffer. So you get new emotional energy. Uh, you get new uh, you know, passion for the day by getting rid of all of the stuff that was in the way from yesterday and making room for some new expenditure. So uh, both good for the brain, good for the body. It turns out REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, mm -hmm. is this type of sleep which uh, lets your brain be very active. So that's where a lot of this memory consolidation is fixed. But it gets prepared by the deep sleep coming before it, 
And here's where things get really fun. The REM sleep is mostly driven by your circadian clocks. The deep sleep is mostly driven by how tired is your body. And so to the extent that you have a routine, you have the same amount of activity every day and your body can expect, I'm gonna go to sleep here, I'll get my body recovery sleep, that preps me for my REM sleep later. And every cycle you have REM at the end, when you're uh, going through the night, there's more and more REM every cycle. So you're building up from getting rid of the body waste and moving into taking care of the brain. But if they don't align, you know, if you sit on a chair all day long and so you, you have trouble going to sleep because you don't have this deep sleep drive, uh, if you are up at different times every day and so your body can't anticipate when should that REM fall, uh, then all of a sudden your sleep doesn't have this nice alignment, uh, the two halves don't line up and, and you're not able to fully recover either your body or your brain. Uh, and so again, the more that you're letting that happen, the more friction you're causing, the more likely something in you is going to go strong. Okay, got it. So uh, I think it's a good time now to move to practical questions. And sure. so, uh, so for people who would, uh, for our listeners who would love to uh, learn like top five tips on how to improve their night sleep, what do you suggest? Number one, two, and three is just have a routine. Um, the, the more that your body knows what to anticipate, the easier it is for it to come along. And part of that complexity is that sleep doesn't come from one brain center, right? As we talked about, for example, there's parts of your brain listening for all of those waste products. And that's how they gauge, did you have a hard day or not? Should I, should I promote more deep sleep? But there's, you know, depending on how you slice it, up to dozens of different brain nuclei that are all trying to vote on whether you should go to sleep or not. And so the more of them that you can get to line up, the easier it is to get that vote to go the way you want it to go. Uh, so for example, a lot of clinicians will say, well, you need a sleep routine. That doesn't help with a lot of parasomnias, but it's a great thing to help a lot of people not get into parasomnias. Uh, it's just basic maintenance, right? Um, it's, it's not that different from eating a good diet. If you every day you know, eat completely random stuff, it's very hard for your body to make good use of that food. If you are used to like, you grew up somewhere and you eat the local food, you know, your microbiome is adapted, your body is adapted, you actually make better use of the nutrients. Uh, sleep is sort of that way. Uh, if you are sleeping in the same bedroom, you have the same sort of wind down routine, uh, you get up and you go to bed at the same time every day, you know, roughly, you don't have to be a monk about it, but that helps a lot. Um, a lot of insomnia comes from, you got some light during the day maybe, and your circadian clock's a little delayed, so you want to stay up. And rather than just say, well, you know, I'll, I'll let that pass, you start a Netflix or something. And now you're getting more light, you're pushing yourself even later, and then tomorrow, your body says, well, I didn't go to sleep until 2. Why are you trying to put me in bed at 11? Uh, right? So you, you fight yourself. Yeah. Uh, so the more that you can have that routine, the more that helps, uh, which, of course, is very challenging for a lot of people for any number of very real practical reasons. Um, the other thing is substances, right? So uh, if you drink alcohol before you go to bed, which is very common, generally, in the short term, that can help you get to sleep. But habit forming over the long term, your body becomes dependent on that. And so as a result, you sleep worse. Uh, and so a lot of alcoholics have insomnia. Uh, most people are not alcoholic, obviously, but to the extent that when you're drinking, you do it at least, eating or drinking really, you do it at least sort of three hours before you plan to go to bed, your body has cleared out that blood sugar, it's cleared out that alcohol, it's really ready to go into restorative sleep rather than being unconscious but having to deal with all this extra waste you gave it before it gets to do its job. Um, so that helps okay. a lot. One of the fun things we see with the wearables is that if you drink a little bit or you eat a little bit before going to bed, your heart rate stays very high, you know, half of the night and sort of mm -hmm. takes half the night to slope down to then have cycles. Um, fun experiment you can do at home. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's also uh, habits about a lot of things that are worth reconsidering, right? So I think alarm clocks are one of the great evils of our time. Um, if you have an alarm clock that wakes you up at the end of your sleep, you're likely interrupting a REM cycle because uh, that's the last stage of your sleep cycle before you wake up usually. What that means is instead of finishing that cycle and getting closure and you, know, you wake up feeling emotionally refreshed, uh, you feel like you got hit in the head, right? All of those things didn't get to complete their process. Uh, there's, there's crap all over the garage effectively, right? And so it's very hard to then be really energetic and active during the day which means 
you may want to end up staying up later because either you weren't active or you felt sort of robbed of the day and you want to take some time back for yourself. It's very common. Um, but it sort of perpetuates this need to wake up with the alarm clock the next day as a result. Uh, and so I, I think one of the signs that things are going well is you shouldn't need an alarm clock. Right? Your body should anticipate when it's waking up. It should be getting enough sleep. Certainly not always easy. Uh, I'm not judging anybody for using an alarm clock. I just want to point out that it, it comes at a cost. And if you can avoid that, that's a good thing. Okay, got it. How about uh, the different uh, uh, lights, you know, different uh, lights of, um, of different wavelengths? Uh, does it have an impact on uh, night sleep? Yeah, it does. It's a great question. So um, we've talked about you have all these circadian clocks. We've talked about how they're sensitive to light. Uh, and it turns out that they're most sensitive to blue light. And so you have these uh, melanopsin sensitive ganglion cells in your retina. And for whatever reason, you know, because the sky is blue, say, they're, they're sensitive to blue light. And that's the biggest trigger for telling all these clocks, hey, it's daytime. And so to the extent that you can see dim light instead of bright light, that's good. To the extent that it's dim and also not blue, that's even better. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, so many subscribers of our channel are interested in uh, natural ways uh, to lower anxiety and uh, blood pressure. So mm -hmm. from the perspective of sleep and the circadian rhythm, so what kind of practical advice can you give them? Yeah, well, so anxiety is highly comorbid with sleep disruptions. Um, and it used to be the thought that anxiety just causes people to have bad sleep, uh, like a lot of sleep and mental health interactions. But more and more people are realizing that bad sleep actually exacerbates the anxiety. And so, uh, and I should say that's 50%, you know, 50, 60% that are diagnosed. So obviously the real numbers are probably higher, um, comorbidities. So one of the simple things to do is just try to hack your sleep, right? Try to, don't, don't think of because I'm anxious, I need to worry about getting to sleep and that propels my anxiety. But just recognize that sort of like if you start going to the gym or you start eating more vegetables, you know, over time, your body will get used to that and you'll start being more healthy and more energetic. Similarly, if you start to really value sleep, if you start to see it as the thing that helps you clean your brain up, clean your body up, that can be motivating to get back into a routine, uh, not think of it as lost time, which you then feel anxious about, but think of it as invested time, which helps you feel better the next day. Try to remember that it really works best in the long run, that it takes time to build the habit. Try to work with your partner. You know, maybe they can be supportive of you. Um, to the extent that you can do it, that's the best natural solution that I'm aware of. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you know, the other way of being natural is getting away, away from unnatural things, right? If you're taking hypnotics uh, or other sleep aids, to the extent you can try to sort of wean yourself off of those, uh, they, they tend to have a suppressive effect on normal sleep cycles. So you're unconscious, but you're not necessarily getting a full night of sleep uh, in a natural way. It's much better than not getting sleep if that's your alternative. But, uh, but to the extent you can get back to not needing them, that's, of course, much healthier. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks again for taking the time. It was a pleasure. And then uh, for um, our users, I would say just uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel for other health exciting interviews. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. I hope it's useful.